armor, firepower, mobility. This is what we call the iron triangle, the essential components of the tank. In this episode, we're going to look at mobility and specifically the engine that powers the tank. It's a history that sees the changing requirements of the tank come up against engineering, technology and industrial capacity. Now, as you can imagine, this is a huge subject, so all we can really do is skim the surface. If there is anything you think we've missed out, anything you'd like to hear more on, then please let us know. This video has been made possible by our supporters on Patreon, our YouTube members, and our super thanks donors. Please join them if you can and support the Tank Museum. And thanks for watching. The basic requirements for a tank engine have remained broadly the same. It must be powerful enough to shift the weight of the vehicle across difficult terrain. It must be compact enough to fit into a relatively small space. It must be reliable enough to keep going under the stresses of a combat environment, often in extreme climatic conditions. And if it breaks, it should be easy enough to repair in the field by soldiers. It also helps if it isn't too thirsty for oils and fuels. The tank, as it appears in 1916, is a far cry from what we have today. These things had a job to do. They had to move across no man's land, punch a hole in the barbed wire and knock out enemy strong points. But they've only got to move at the same speed as the infantry. They've got no suspension. So the degree of mobility is going to be distinctly limited. The first engine to be used in a tank was one of these. This is a British Daimler 105 horsepower, six cylinder petrol engine. And Foster's, the original builders, been using these uh, in heavy duty tractors uh, to pull big artillery pieces. It's sitting here it's right in the middle of the fighting compartment. And that's a major problem for the crew because it generates a huge amount of heat. In here, it can be up to 45 degrees C. Um, if you brush against it, these exhausts are red hot, so you're going to get burnt. And it fills the fighting compartment with carbon monoxide. So that means you've got a thumping red headache and you're feeling sick to the pit of your stomach. It also creates a huge amount of noise. So verbal communication between the crew is just about impossible. It's a thoroughly unpleasant environment. By the end of the war, uh, things are improving in terms of power. The 150 horsepower Ricardo, which you find in tanks from the Mark V onwards, gives a third more power. And vehicles like this, this is the Whippet. This is capable of eight miles an hour, although it does have two Tyler bus engines inside and it is fiendishly difficult to drive. World War I showed the devastating potential of the tank and strategists began to experiment with a tank concept that is much more in tune with what we know today. The interwar period is one of considerable innovation in terms of tank design, and the British Army in particular is devising different vehicles to do different jobs on the battlefield. Different tanks need different engines, but the one thing that these have in common is they don't compromise crew comfort and safety as much as earlier designs. The engine is in a separate compartment away from the crew. Small, fast tanks like this Light Mark 6B were designed for reconnaissance. And this is powered by Meadows six cylinder, 88 horsepower petrol engine. That's very similar to the types that were used in high performance Lagonda cars. To support the infantry, heavily armored but slow vehicles such as the Matilda II were developed. Introduced in 1939, it was one of the most heavily armoured tanks of the time. It weighed 25 tonnes, could just manage 15 miles an hour, but it needed two 7-litre, 190-horsepower diesel bus engines to achieve this. That said, when it was tested in combat in 1940, it did extremely well, but became seen as too slow as the war moved into the desert. To replace the cavalry on the modern battlefield, fast and lightly armoured cruiser tanks were developed. This is the A13 cruiser tank Mark III. Dates from 1938. It's powered by the Nuffield Liberty V12 340 horsepower petrol engine. And that design is based on a First World War aero engine. 
Uh, the tank itself is aided by Christie suspension, can do a bit over 30 miles an hour, despite the fact it weighs 14 tonnes. But the main problem with these tanks is it's thinly armoured, so they don't perform well against German armour in France in 1940. It seems that in Britain at least, there's a tendency to try and take the easy way out, buy an engine from a commercial manufacturer, and then try and shoehorn it into a tank. And this is something that's going to mess up tank design throughout most of the war. Even arguably the best tank engine of the period, the Meteor, is a downrated version of the Rolls-Royce Merlin aero engine that powered the Spitfire. World War II brought a demand for mass production that had never been seen before, forcing industry to increase capacity and scale up production to meet the demand for planes, ships, vehicles, tanks and all their components. This is not as easy as it sounds, and with the two most numerous tanks produced, M4 Sherman and the T-34, we have two different approaches matching the economic systems of the nations that built them. Soviet T-34 was built around its Kharkov V2 diesel engine. This is a V12 engine with a double overhead camper bank and direct fuel injection, and these are features that are still used in modern high-performance diesels. It's also aluminium in construction, making it light, with an excellent power-to-weight ratio. Well-designed and very robust, it wasn't just used in the T-34, but also the BT-7M, KV-1 and 2 tanks and IS tanks, as well as the SU-122, SU-85 and SU-100 tank destroyers. And having the same engine in a variety of vehicles has advantages in terms of logistics, parts supply, and also crew training, because if a crew can cross deck from one vehicle to another and know that a lot of the mechanicals are the same, that's got obvious advantages. The fact that it is diesel is also a positive advantage. Diesel, being less volatile than petrol, decreases the likelihood of fire. And that's an important consideration given the Soviet habit of mounting extra fuel drums on the rear of the tank. The Kharkov V2 also used roughly a quarter of the fuel of the Maybach HL230 uh, as fitted to the Tiger and the Panther. This is very much the Soviet approach. A good, robust design capable of mass production, well over 150,000 units. And the whole thing about the production of the T-34 and the Kharkov V2 is a totalitarian state devoting its entire energies towards war production. The US M4 Sherman was produced on much the same scale as the T-34, 50,000 as opposed to 70,000. But rather than there being one engine type, there are as many as five, with four being used in large numbers. This has to do with the USA being a free market economy. Now, no one factory has got the capacity to produce all the tank engines needed. So the tank construction industry has to accept what is available. And that's quite a range of engines. We're going to take a look at two of them, starting with the Continental R975 radial. There's quite a history of aero engines being repurposed for tank use. And this one, the R975, is no exception. It's actually part of the same family of engines that powered aircraft like the Ford Trimotor. As you can see, it's a radial, so the nine cylinders are, are positioned around the crankshaft. And it's also air-cooled, so the cylinder heads have these cooling fins in order to aid heat transfer. It's quite tall um, compared to the normal inline type of engine, which is why the Sherman, for its size, is actually quite a tall tank. If the R975 seems like a slightly unusual engine to put in a tank, this one, the Chrysler A57 Multibank, is in a whole different league. This huge power unit, and it weighs two and a half tonnes, is actually five separate six-cylinder inline engines bolted together around a single crankcase. So it does look a bit like that radial engine we saw just. It was relatively simple to produce because each individual engine is a Chrysler 425 horsepower car engine. Uh, they had been in production since the 1920s. And once some basic problems had been ironed out, it was fairly reliable. In spite of this, the US Army preferred the conventional 500 horsepower Ford GAA V8 
Rich Sherman's. So the majority of M4A4s fitted with a multibank engine were supplied to the British via Lend-Lease. Quantity has a quality all of its own, and the German war machine could never keep up with that scale of production. Now, Germany produced some of the biggest and heaviest tanks of all, but the impact of these notorious giants on the final result is highly debatable. Tiger 1, Tiger 2, Jagd Tiger, Panther all rely on the Maybach HL210-230 range of engines. Um, now that is a V12 23 litre 700 horsepower petrol engine and that's adequate to move something like the 54 tonne Tiger 1 around but when you expect fundamentally the same engine to lug around the 68 and a half tons of one of these or the 72 tons of Jag Tiger, the problems are obvious. As a company, Maybach was primarily a heavy engineering concern, and they specialised not in building complete engines, but in the precision milling and assembly parts of the process. Now, this leads to two problems. Firstly, they're dependent on a supply line for components, and secondly, they don't have much experience in mass production. And both of these things are going to trip them up. There was also far too much emphasis on producing complete engines and vehicles rather than spares. So spare shortages and the logistics of supplying front line thousands of kilometres away meant that tanks could be immobilised for long periods simply through a lack of spare parts. Maybach also suffered from a shortage of raw materials and particularly non-ferrous metals and rubber and there were arguably issues with the quality of that which could be produced. And the whole supply chain was of course disrupted by massive Allied bombing. The lesson here is that it doesn't matter how good the tank is, if its engine requires an intensely technological production process, it is more difficult to make. If it's underpowered for its role, it's more likely to fail. And if the spares aren't there to repair it, then the whole tank becomes completely useless. So what we have here is the situation where the war is as much won on the factory floor as it is on the battlefield. A huge leap forward in tank technology during World War II was assimilated into the main battle tank designs of the Cold War. But in any discussion of tank engines, we can't ignore the legendary chieftain. This British Army's mainstay during most of the Cold War, was powered by the Leyland L60 19-litre V6 multi-fuel engine. It was a unique design, but it's also deeply flawed. It was said that the Chieftain was the best tank in the world, as long as it broke down in the right place. The reason for the choice of a two-stroke engine is twofold. Firstly, it is relatively compact. So this 19 litre diesel engine, that's its usual fuel, can produce about as much power, uh, 650 horsepower, as the 27 litre Meteor. If you want a smaller engine, you can limit the size of the engine compartment and actually keep the height of the tank down. Secondly, it's multi-fuel. And this is a NATO requirement from 1967. So this engine can, if needed, run on diesel, petrol, avgas, whatever happens to be available. And that is a very important concept in combat conditions. It's also a good design in that it's a complete power pack. So you've got the engine, transmission and the cooling systems all in one unit. And that's something we've carried on into the Challenger series of tank engines. This means that an engine change in the field can be carried out in under two hours using the crane on an FV434 armoured repair vehicle. Maintenance or repair to the power pack can then be carried out in a workshop rather than in the field, and the tank isn't out of the fight. That was also a good thing because the early L60s had some major problems. The build quality was pretty poor. Uh, the maintenance record was abysmal. In fact, it harmed Britain's 
uh, reputation for tank construction. So much so that nations that had bought Centurion didn't buy Chieftain. They replaced them with West German Leopards instead. Constant problems with cylinder linings, seals, coolant leaks, fans meant that the L60 was an absolute nightmare for Chieftain crews and for their maintenance teams. Things did get better after several rounds of modifications. The Chieftain commander I spoke to reckoned that working the tank hard and often was the best cure. The British Army's current main battle tank, Challenger 2, can show us just how far we've come. The engine is a Perkins V12 diesel delivering 1200 brake horsepower. Now that is twice as much as the Rolls-Royce Meteor and it's almost four times as much as the early World War II Nuffield Liberty engine. That power is going to be used though because Challenger weighs 64 tonnes with combat armour modules that goes up to 74 tonnes and that's two to three times as much as the average World War II tank. Even so, the tank is capable of over 37 miles an hour, that's 59 kilometres an hour, on the road, and 25 miles an hour, 40 kilometres an hour, across country. Excellent mobility. Challenger also has uh, an auxiliary power unit which operates off a smaller Perkins diesel. That's a very useful feature because it means that even when the main engine is switched off, the tank systems can be kept up and running. And that, of course, includes the all-important boiling vessel. The advantage of this is that by not running the main engine, it saves fuel, always important in something like a thirsty MBT, and cuts down on the audio and thermal signature of the tank. There are occasions when the best thing a tank can do is sit there, hold down and unnoticed, and not having the main engine running, belting out heat and a huge exhaust plume, can be very useful in a tactical sense. Tanks and tank engines have come a huge way in the course of just over a century. We start with a 105 horsepower petrol engine, which could move 28 tonnes of tank at four miles an hour, and finish with a 1200 horsepower engine, which can propel 64 tonnes at 40 miles an hour. That's roughly four times the weight, 10 times the power, and 10 times the speed. But what we can see is that the evolution of the tank engine occurs in tandem with the evolution of firepower and protection. The need to move across difficult terrain sets as standard a requirement for something more powerful than what you'd need in a road-going vehicle. But as anti-tank warfare develops and tanks begin to encounter other tanks on the battlefield, armour needs to get thicker. Tank guns get bigger to compensate for that, so tanks get heavier, therefore the engines need to be better and more efficient in order to carry the weight. Throughout history, the size of a tank has been governed by the availability of an engine strong enough to power it. But as the role of tanks on the battlefield changes, as their form and function evolves, so will the unit that powers it. I hope you enjoyed this video. Many thanks for watching. Uh, if you did, please subscribe. And if you can, support us on Patreon.